Um, so my name is David Wise. I'm the art director here at MFG, um, a design and creative practice um, based in Orem, Utah. Uh, I'm Maureen. I'm a graphic designer here at MFG. And we're really excited to have Kaylee and Shun for the last of um, you know, the first annual Ellipsis lecture series. Um, I'm not gonna give too much away of like the origin story bio. I'll let them sort of speak to it through the process um, and everything. But I do wanna express just how intensely excited and curious I am for this lecture. Um, it's something that a little over a year ago, maybe a year and a half or so, um, I came across what essentially was the development and like the brand story of OEM through through Instagram and since seeing that first video of um, of them calibrating uh, cardboard um, boxes and sort of seeing that intention and like level of detail being considered, um, I knew that this is something that I need to watch and I need to pay attention to. And it's since grown into I think one of the most visually, poetically, and like exciting brands um, within any space. So without further ado, um, Shun and Kaylee. Wow, thank you so much, David. That was very kind. Um, yeah, we're very excited. Uh, for those who don't know, OEM is a healthcare products company. Um, we're gonna dive into what that means exactly and what, what we make. But um, for this presentation, we're gonna talk about you know, why we started OEM, uh, how we started the entire process, design, development, production, um, and then kind of where we are now and where we see it heading in the future. So Shun's gonna kind of kick it off and um, start it. Here we go. Yeah, so um, I'm originally from Tokyo, Japan. Uh, moved around a little bit when I was younger. Uh, lived in the States for a little bit, in England for a little bit, back to Tokyo, and um, then to Canada, where I met Kaylee in middle school. This is where I used to live in uh, Tokyo. This is my family. Um, growing up in Japan, I think there was definitely like a strong sense of community. A, a lot of things were done in groups, like a team mentality. Um, I think especially in Asia, it's quite common for families to live together. You know, living with your grandparents, even your great grandparents. Um, and I think them taking care of you, you know, you take care of them. And with Japan's like inverted triangle demographic, you know, I think we're just like surrounded with like elderly care and I think like the experiences I had there really became the foundation of who I am today. And I think what inspired, like what's to become OEM is my other grandparents. Um, after that, I moved to, yeah, so I moved to Canada, um, went through high school and then went to business school. Um, I guess that was like more of a practical choice for me. Um, I was doing graphic design in high school. Started with like Corel Draw in IT class. I don't know if people know Corel Draw, but it's like a yeah, like a <laughs> inferior Illustrator. That's where I started doing graphic design and had T-shirt brands all throughout high school and college. And um, I always just thought I could get back into art afterwards. Um, so yeah, we both specialized in marketing. Um, so yes, I had t-shirt brand like this, uh, and then after graduating, I actually couldn't get any interviews, um, but one brand, uh, I guess, took, or I asked to have coffee with them, and it was Native Shoes, it's this EVA footwear brand from Vancouver, um, yeah, and I just was like, I'll be your unpaid intern. <laughs> um, Hard sell. And um, yeah, so I was unpaid intern for like a couple months and became like a marketing coordinator. It was like 10 people. Everyone was multi wearing multiple hats. Um, 
Yeah, I think eventually just became like a graphic designer and then became an art director eventually had a team of like five amazing designers. And I think that's probably where I learned most about design and because we had um, this amazing graphic designer called Mark Bulford. He was a lot better than everyone <laughs> at the brand, but he like taught us everything I think we know today. Um, and um, yeah, I, was, I guess like because it's so small, I was next to like the product department. So I learned a lot about product development, product design. I was doing all the colorways for the shoes and photo shoots, but at the same time you're like next to like these people touching like wood maquettes of like EVA molds from China and like how to communicate with them. Um, everything about the company was like right there, like customer service even. It's like e-com. Like, so I think it was like a really valuable experience for me. Um, yeah, there's some publications. And then uh, the creative director there uh, always lived in Venice here, Venice, California. Or Venice, Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark Gaynor, he was um, also a creative director at this eyewear brand called Garrett Light. Um, so after three years at Native, uh, he kind of just brought me down here. I always wanted to come to LA. I got to come to LA a couple of times through work because he was here. And um, yeah, it was like a ticket to LA and Kaylee came she also found a job at the same time. Um, and then there, I guess I did the same kind of thing in-house art director with a couple of designers. Uh, the team was similar size. They're making similar amount of money. Um, so a lot of the functions within the company was similar, but um, a totally different price point. Um, these eyewears were like, you know, three, four hundred dollars um and uh the, our shoes were like 50 bucks and warehousing was like completely different because you know you're dealing with tiny products so the warehouse was tiny and you look at shoes and it's like i think it's like one of the worst businesses to be in because you gotta have like a full size run we had kids sizes we had all the way to like adult tw 12 size or size 12 and um but yeah, just like more experience because they were also making eyewear in China. So I was next to people designing eyewear. I did a whole lot of packaging and they had biannual publications. Um, I know I, I learned a lot here as well. Um, yeah, more publication stuff. Oh, we launched a brand called Mr. Light. Uh, so his dad, is Larry Light. He's one of the founders of Oliver Peoples. So they launched um, a new brand called Mr. Light, which was even more expensive, but everything was made in Japan. So I got to travel there, meet like their suppliers and how it is different, like to deal with factories in Japan and China. Um, but yeah, super valuable experience for me. Um, got to do more like maybe higher budget stuff like window displays and um, yeah. And then moved on to freelancing after two years at Garelight. Um, Just wanted to try something out or try freelance out, I guess. Um, and then, you know, being in LA, we got to meet a lot of people really like organically it wasn't like let's go to an event and like Network. meet certain people or something but just luckily yeah we met a bunch of people so I got to work independently also through different studios for uh different clients um like Nike, Yeezy, Kanye West, Porter Robinson and all kinds of stuff I did everything under the roof but um yeah that's pretty much it for me. Cool. Yeah. So similar to Shun, I also grew up kind of moving around. Um, I was born in Toronto in Canada and moved to Scotland when I was four. And here are me as me and my family in our Scottish fits. Um, my dad was Scottish. Um, so we fit in quite well there. Um, I lived 
kind of in the middle of nowhere in Scotland. Uh, so it was this glen, which is kind of like a valley. Um, and there was about a hundred people who lived in that entire area. Um, there were eight kids in my entire school. So it was um, a really unique experience. And when you live somewhere that's, you know, has such few people uh, and you're so far from like a city or a town, uh, you really kind of learn to look out for each other and care for each other. So you're always going out over to your neighbors if they need something. Uh, if you're having a party, it's literally a party with your whole Glen, the whole Glen is there. Um, and so, and then even at school, it's like you're all in one classroom. The older kids are always looking after the younger kids. Um, there's this constant, like, you know, sense of community and care. Uh, and similar to Shun, like, that's something I wanted to really bring into OEM. Um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I've also lived in South Africa. So it brought a lot of experience from like different cultures and experiencing different cultures, um, you know, really helped me. Um, in that phase and, and development uh, and my awareness of, you know, what is care in different communities. Um, but ultimately, you know, we ended up in Victoria in Canada, um, started dating in high school. So we're high school sweethearts. Um, and uh, after college, after we both went and did marketing, I went kind of a different route to Shun. He went the more creative marketing route. Um, I went more, um, I don't know, traditional digital marketing route. Uh, and so my driven. first, the data driven route. Uh, and so I, my first job was at a growth or sorry, a tech startup. Um, and um, this is where I really discovered this world of growth hacking. So I had the great opportunity to be like the first marketing hire at this company. And they were just like a bunch of developers who were like, get in there and do whatever you can, just drive more users to our platform. Um, so I had this really like free kind of reign to try whatever I could back then. Uh, and digital marketing was very different back then. It was, um, you know, now it's very aggressive, you know, Facebook ads, um, it's very noisy. Um, it's a lot harder to, um, you know, get your voice heard um, in today's digital marketing world. But back then, you could use very hacky methods, which worked really well, but you would cringe at now. So I was on like Twitter mass DMing people. I was buying email lists and sending emails to people, all like the worst kind of marketing, but it worked really well back then. Uh, and I managed to get our platform, you know, from like zero to 300,000 users um, using all these methods. Uh, and this kind of introduced me to the early stages of like Facebook advertising, um, email marketing, um, all of the like social media marketing. Um, and within this company, I slowly moved my way up and eventually became VP of growth and had the opportunity to pitch to investors, to build out growth projections, to work with the developers, to um, you know, design new revenue channels uh, and really kind of advance my skills in growth. Um, so I eventually I hit a point where I was like at a ceiling. I, you know, I reached a great you know, position there, but I wanted to challenge myself uh, at a larger company. So I went to shoes.com. Um, and so I went from like this 25 person team to a 600 person team. And it was this totally different you know, environment, very corporate. Um, and I had a very specific job uh, there as an ad specialist and they gave me a $3 million budget and basically asked me to generate as much revenue as I can from that $3 million, uh, and learned a ton with that. So I took that money and, uh, did social advertising, display advertising, um, all these different types of advertising online, um, basically testing every network to find, you know, which was the best one, um, and scaling the opportunities that we saw, um, but even, you know, after about a year, I realized that was a very unfulfilling kind of role. Uh, you know, it doesn't feel good to just be constantly trying to, it feels very manipulative. You're constantly trying to tweak ads, tweak copy imagery, and, you know, almost like trick people into purchasing shoes that they probably don't need. Um, but you're not building any kind of loyalty. You're not telling them any kind of story about who you are. Why should they buy from you? Um, you know, there's no patience in that kind of marketing. It's very quick, um, and, uh, very forceful kind of marketing. So, um, I was very unfulfilled by that. Um, 
And so when Shun got the job opportunity in LA, um, I was very lucky to find a job um, with a streetwear brand called The Hundreds. Um, so this is an LA based streetwear brand. And um, very, again, very opposite of shoes.com, which was 600 person team. Uh, the hundreds, I think had about 50 employees. Um, the hundreds really started as a blog. So again, opposite um, just from the foundations, uh, they're very community oriented. Um, they started as a blog. So it was very storytelling, very long form. And they had a lot of events. Um, it was very in-person. There was this connection with the customers. The customers had been around for 15 years from the very beginning. They were dedicated, loyal to the brand. Uh, and I was really intrigued by this um, loyalty that they created. Um, and I was able to kind of go in there and revamp their online, their website, um, and really integrate the storytelling into the e-commerce experience, which was one thing they were just kind of not managing to connect. Um, and when we did that, we saw amazing performance. Um, so I revamped the entire website. We launched a mobile app. We launched text message marketing. Um, I revamped the customer service department and the processes there. Um, wow. And yeah, obviously we moved them from Magento, which is a beast of an e-commerce platform to Shopify, which is amazing. Uh, and just the number one kind of platform. Um, so just giving them the right toolkit. And, and we saw amazing performance um, with those changes. Um, but ultimately I, you know, I still wanted to be my own boss and work for myself. And so I took this chance to take the leap and go freelance, uh, wasn't as easy breezy as this girl makes it seem, but, um, you know, it was a lot of, it was a big learning curve, uh, trying to get clients, uh, trying to deal with clients. Um, but ultimately having that, uh, gave me the freedom to work on this idea OEM uh, with Shun. So the idea, uh, Shun and I started kind of formulating this idea. He had been freelance for, you know, almost a year before me. So he had more time to actually work on this idea. Uh, but now we could like really dive into it together. Um, so, you know, why did we start OEM? Where does this idea come from? Uh, so the idea really comes from the experience we get when we go to a drugstore. Uh, and I think there was like a specific week uh, that Shun and I were both, we both had colds uh, and we walked into CVS and we were brainstorming, thinking about what we wanted to do together. And we walked into CVS and we're like looking around and we're like, there's like bright lights, it's carpeted floors. You have, you know, a hundred different options for every ailment and the prices are slightly different. It's overwhelming. You don't know which one is the best one. Um, and we're just like, this is, crazy. Like, you know, this is not an experience you should be going through when you're feeling sick or under the weather. Like right now. Um, like right now. Um, cause we both have COVID. <laughs> By the way. Yeah. We both have COVID right now. Um, but powering through, um, but yeah, like this is the last place I'd want to go and not that I'd go in public, um, with COVID, but like, this is not a welcoming place or a place that would make me feel cared for. Um, you know, why have we just accepted this experience? And I think everyone's just like, hasn't even thought to question it because we're so used to it. Um, so, you know, the idea for OEM was really to just change this experience and make it a better one and make it one that people feel cared for. Um, so Sean and I, obviously we love like doing reading and love entrepreneurship and reading about how people start businesses. Um, one book that has always stood out to us, um, we probably read it multiple times now. Uh, it's called Start With Why by Simon Sinek. Um, highly recommend it if you're thinking about starting a business or anything. Um, and the idea behind it is that um, his concept is that people buy they don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. Um, so they're not buying the object itself, but they're buying the inspiration that you bring, the feeling that you give them. Um, at least that's what good brands do. And so the example that he gives that's really great is Apple. Um, and he was saying how, if Apple did marketing like everyone else, they would focus on the what. So there's three levels here. There's the why, the how, and the what. Uh, if Apple, Apple did marketing like everyone else, they'd focus on the what, and they'd say, we make great computers. 
they might integrate the why or the how a little bit and say, we make great computers. Um, they're user friendly and beautifully designed. Uh, but if, you know, if every company did that, then they all sound, you know, they all sound the same. It's not very competitive. Uh, any company can say that. Um, so what Apple does differently is they start with the why when they do their marketing. So they will say something like, you know, we challenge the status quo. Uh, we think different. And by doing that, we design beautifully or we make beautifully designed computers um, that are user friendly. We just happen to make great computers. So they reverse the order. Um, but by starting with why you instill this inspiration, this feeling uh, that people attach to and that creates long-term customers. And so when we created OEM or we started thinking about OEM, we you know, knew from the very beginning there had to be a strong why. And so our why is very simply care. We want OEM to inspire people to care. We want people to feel cared for throughout the process from opening the product for the very first time to using it, to going on our website, uh, every single touch point, they should feel care and then should be inspired to care for others. And so we created this manifesto. Oh my gosh, it's cut off. So let me see if I can. Yeah, so our manifesto is we are inspired by moments of care. We honor those who put needs of others before their own. At OEM, we simply aim to create better tools for care between loved ones, friends, strangers, and all those in between. We believe that care is the foundation to improve health for all. So um, this is the manifesto that we live by, that we are constantly rereading and looking at whatever we're creating, whatever we're doing, this has to make sense. And it's really inspired again by our childhood, you know, where we grew up, you know, putting, we, we, you know, honor those who put the needs of others before their own. That's really inspired by like the grandparents we lived with or the communities we lived in. Um, and we really want to act as tools. We're not trying to center ourselves in your life, but we're just tools for, for conducting this, you know, inspirational thing, this, this care. Yeah. So I guess, what does this look like? Um, like what's our vision, I guess? Um, I guess we wanted to create a new drugstore experience that's one that's warm, caring, you know, soothing, maybe calming, just a pleasant experience. Um, we're definitely inspired by Japanese designers, uh, aesthetics, philosophies. Um, one of the books that was hugely impactful for us was Designing Design by Ken Yahara. There's a section about, it's called Haptic, um, he talks about how, you know, shape, color, and material and texture is not like the only thing uh, in design. And I think the how you make people, I guess, sense something is really important. So, you know, it's not just like color and form. It's like the research into how we, um, I guess, research into, I guess, how we um, sense, I guess, is a critical part of design. Um, it's a really good book. Um, highly recommend it if you haven't read it. Uh, and just wanted to be consistent, uh, start to build trust. So obviously the labeling system, uh, easily recognizable. And wanted to start creating products for health. Uh, but health is not just physical, it's also mental. Um, but we wanted to come up with, I guess, for the launch, um, a set of products that is pertaining to cold. Uh, so we looked at um, products that we grew up with, um, things that you need when you have a cold, so like cough suppressant um, for sore throat or uh, congestion, uh, dry skin. Well, these are a lot of products lips. that like, have just no one's ever, you know, there's, there's maybe variations, but like no one's really reinvented these like core products that we like grew up with. Yeah, we just kind of accept it as they are, but, and dehydration, um, since we have a drink. So we got to work and we, uh, I guess, like, how do we want to experience care and what do we, yeah, I guess like we want it to be true to ourselves, like 
um, like authentic to ourselves. I, I guess it's like a natural way to also escape competition is just being true to yourself and because no one can be you, you know? And I think we just looked internally, like what do we like? Uh, what are we inspired by? And just, you know, we love like weird science nature stuff. We love, you know, how do we get Hinoki into our products? Is it like environment? Is it scent? Uh, we use we use Hinoki in a few of our products, like our sanitizer and cream. Um, we love, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. Uh, what does our packaging look like? How can we uh, introduce technology? Um, what does the environment look like? What does our furniture look like? Um, yeah, how do we insert kids? My grandma dressing Kaylee. Um, and we also talked about death, like the, the cycle of life. And we we're always inspired by weird, like universe stuff, like videos. We'll talk about that after. But, um, and uh, we came up with the name OEM. So I guess the naming was quite complicated for us because um, we had like hundreds of names. Um, I actually love naming brands. I've done it all my life just, but this time we had to register it, uh, trademark it in uh, multiple classes. So uh, that means, so we have, uh, like a trademark for OEM in like cosmetics category or soft drinks category. And I think another one was like for uh, topicals. I think so there's different classes. So you have to be able to trademark the same name in multiple classes or say like so if someone else has an OEM brand that already makes drinks, then we couldn't have done it. Like, so we had to make this like unique name. Um, and we didn't really want to have, have it have like a, we didn't want it to have any meaning behind it. Um, and luckily we went with OEM. I know it already means like or original equipment manufacturing, but um, no one was trademarking a three letter word OEM. It was kind of catchy. It was, I don't know, it fit the things that I think we wanted to do. And, um, and a friend sent us this video one day uh, it's a video that's linked to our website. If you click, if you don't click enter, if you click leave, you it leads to, to this like YouTube video. Highly recommend it. Watch it. It's like half an hour long though, but it, like changed. Life changing. Yeah, it was pretty <laughs> life changing. Essentially just shows like, it's like a fast forward from like now to infinity and we're like not even a blip uh, in time, but so one day we came up with this acronym on earth momentarily it was just super random i think it was like after watching that video we we're like how about on earth momentarily yeah. and it just stuck so we use it sometimes um and i think it fits like a lot of the things that we push i guess mm. the video just made us really feel like you know our time here is so brief um you just feel so insignificant uh, but in like kind of a beautiful way. Um, and so, and then we already had trademarked OEM and I was just like, what, you know, I feel like we should have a meaning for OEM. <laughs> and he just, Shun just thought of this and it was like so perfect. And I think it brings back to like the whole care aspect because, you know, we're, we're here for a brief moment on earth. And it's kind of like this crazy miracle that we are collectively here together at the same time. So like, why wouldn't we care for each other or look out for each other? And that's kind of, again, that inspiration of care um, for OEM. Um, yeah, designed our logo. We wanted something that uh, looked established uh, because we were making products for healthcare. We wanted something that looks like, uh, yeah, established and something that you can trust. Um, a little bit medical, a um, little bit forward looking um eventually we'll like to just use this uh different ways of you know on and off i think we we're developing this like animation i think it's on our uh footer on our website we picked this color as i mean we don't really i mean we don't have like a brand guide but 
I think we just like this color as something that's like soothing and uh, a little bit medical. Um, I've, yeah, we thought it was like, it was a perfect color. And then, but we didn't want to be like too bland, I guess. So we use rainbow as like an accent color um, sometimes. And uh, we started thinking about product design. I mean, these, all these things were happening pretty much at the same time. So we, for this presentation, we kind of try to clump them like together, timeline. but it's sort of in chronological order. Um, so yeah, again, we are just looking at what we grew up with, what we're inspired by, what, you know, we were surrounded by. So we were like looking at mochi um, as an inspiration for shape. Uh, we started our lip balm design first, um, looking at different applications. Oh yeah, we were trying to develop sticks first, I guess. Um, yeah, what does it look like across products? This is our old name that didn't make out. Uh, this, we have two different shades or colors. The mint one is usually like flavored or scented. The white ones are uh, not scented. Um, and maybe we'll make a carbonated drink. Um, and uh, yeah, just we get different products. So this is when our factory um, sent our first 3D model of our lip balm. Believe it or not, this was our first sample. <laughs> Horrible, but I don't, I was super worried. <laughs> but uh, yeah, That's our design, good. 3D sample. But they sent us this afterwards. I don't know what the first one was about. Um, but yeah, we start sampling or 3D printing. printing. I guess we could have done this locally, but we were already talking to a factory. Um, yeah, this is just to show like inner support for P liners. P liners, you'll see it later on. Um, yeah, just a bunch of samples, kind of the evolution. Oh, this is my guy, Jammy. Sorry, I can't wait. I can wait after you go home. Did you drink? Please drink in moderation. I think he called me while I was partying or something. This was pre-production sample before all the colors and stuff. Uh, we started developing aluminum bottles. Uh, this is for our san uh, hand sanitizers. So a lot of back and forth, kind of like this. Uh, just pictures and whatever font on top. Super clear com communication. Actually, this is good design. Uh, different tones of color. A lot of this. A lot of decks going back and forth and red lines. And Shun's probably the most annoying person for any factory to work with because he literally is a perfectionist. <laughs> I mean, I think you just... I learned about this, I guess, in... I know both footwear and eyewear. I think those the experience that I had there was hugely important to me mm -hmm. or valuable to me. Um, like eyewear, you, you deal with like, I don't even know, the unit below millimeters. Mm -hmm. I can't remember what it was, but yeah, different treatments, um, like things rubbing off. So you have to change the way you print, but it's always like a compromise because I won't tell you why I don't like the right side, but the things that I don't like, but you have to compromise, compromise. And this is quite cool. Like the way they do this printing, it's called pad printing. Uh, if you YouTube it, it's like the weirdest, most interesting way of printing on 3D objects. Uh, different rounds of samples, a lot of samples. This is part of it. This is Kaylee picking up some product from our warehouse when they arrived and just QCing. So I learned about QCing in footwear because um, they were dealing with EVA footwear. A lot of times they come warped or shrunk or in eyewear too. And, you know, they, when, once the shipment comes, they open up pretty much every single frame and they check, you know, and then report back, like how many were damaged, how many were messed up. A lot of our bottles were dented and it wasn't the factory's fault, but, you know, being picky about the difference in colors. 
weird uh, sleeves. Um, and for the formula formulas like inside the containers, um, we started just like researching. Like we've never been in this industry um, and we don't pretend to be. And we had to find uh, experts in this field, but what we could have, what we could do is really just like read and read and read everywhere we could, buy every product that we thought was good, uh, looking into the ingredients. And, you know, you can't just like know the ingredients. You have to obviously make the formula and that's where like the experts come in. And um, yeah, we luckily found a lab in LA um, this is probably the hardest part um, when we start started the process. Um, but yeah, we luckily found a lab that my family friend, like dad, like worked with like years ago. Because um, we I literally hit up like I don't know a couple dozen labs, um, mainly in California, but even. Yeah, me in California, but no one would even reply to you. I, I even called. No one even picks up. I don't know how they know that we're nobodies. But um, so yeah, that was really hard. And um, yeah, we started working with this lab, started developing all of our products. Um, this Kaylee's pie charts. We we're <coughs> competitive analysis. We we're making these different scents with our friend. Ian Lanterman, he's actually an amazing photographer, but he is also amazing at making sense, also in Vancouver. But yeah, pretty much, I, I mean, not pretty much everyone, but a lot of people we were work with are Canadians. So shout out Canadians. Um, yeah, just testing, different products, same here. Dex and then, yeah, we start working with um, some 3D, or CGI artists. Uh, this is with Dean Giffen. He's from Australia originally, but he lives in Vancouver. He's like independent. You might know him, but um, he brought on, I knew him through Instagram uh, for a long time, but we just never met. Uh, we never really spoke, but like we just respected each other's work or something. And one day I brought this up to him and he was, kind enough to uh, work on it with us. And he brought on his friend, um, Colin Young from, and he's in London with uh, more and more, but he, Colin's also Canadian. And he's also from the island, uh, Vancouver Island, uh, where we're from. So I don't know, it's that Canadian energy again, but yeah, we start sending um, like more like supernatural uh, references. Um, these are a bunch of things that we we were inspired by. Kind of wanted to make this like abstract video because um, we kind of <clears throat> see our aesthetic as like not like Apple, but it's definitely that, but more like a 2.0. Um, so these are some working progress videos. Um, just they're developing just different looks and like what we liked and what we were inspired by. And we decided, uh, we st started narrowing down, got some still life done. Uh, these are some clips off of our video that we launched with. You can see it on our homepage. So yeah, this is super, super exciting for us um some still life for a lip balm and ointment yeah just amazing talent uh you know we couldn't have done it without them um and yeah i mean amazing amazing stuff uh, um and then we were working on our website at the same time this is our launch page with uh Buggy, Buggy Studio with uh, Quinton and Thomas. <coughs> they were um, also starting out then and they were kind enough to um, work with us. Um, and yeah, and these are all our 
ecom imagery. They're all CGI as well. Uh, we wanted to have this like super clean look and consistent across products. Okay. Um, and oh yeah, these were done by another Canadian friend, Zach Ben Lulu. This is our incense. We launched it. Um, Post launch of yeah. the brand. <coughs> Sorry. Yeah, these turned out great. Um, and then we started receiving our real product production products. Uh, we were super happy with them. Honestly, I I talked to um, a, uh, a friend who was in the product department at uh, Native Shoes, and you usually get like um, like one to one. They're called. Um, I think they were made by like MDF or some sort of super high density foam, or sometimes wood even. But it's like like precise to like 100%, but we got those like 3D printed <clears throat> versions and they were not 100%, they're like 80% if that. Um, so we, you know, opening a mold for the, is like probably the biggest cost that we had to pay. And we, I guess, took a chance because there was really no way for us to, you know, this is during COVID, so we couldn't have travel to China and, check it out before production and things like that. But really, really lucky that it turned out this way. Um, this is our ambassador. Our, our biggest fan. ambassador, Saturn. Yeah. <laughs> she likes the product. Oh yeah, she loves the product. A um, little bit more about packaging. This is Apple's packaging. I'm sure a lot of you like their packaging, but you know, I've had like the opportunity to work on packaging in different companies and over the last like, you know, 10 years, but what they do is, you know, you have to have the right resources and the, and the money to make this happen. And so we did the best we could, um, even these like sharp corners, like I was obsessed with, but yeah. So a lot of like just printing and cutting and just mocking it up um, ourselves, trying to, yeah, figure it out with just printed paper, how it feels, how's the size, um, how they look together. Um, yeah, a lot of this. Use a rainbow, a continuous rainbow. When you flip it, it doesn't break. You know, we were developing two packs for hand scientists are developing it's packaging with our printer. Uh, so like you don't have to buy the sprayer heads every time you can just buy the bottles. Um, okay, this looks like chicken or something. Um, yeah, a lot of this, again, uh, dealing with small stuff, um, but clear communication was a key. Uh, we made corrugated boxes uh, with a domestic supplier because even though it might have cost, or I think it was, you know, more economical to produce them in Taiwan. That's where all our packaging is from. But uh, the shipping would have cost uh, a lot. So he actually recommended just going with a domestic one. So we started developing the mailers. We call them the mailers, um, trying different variations, uh, configurations. This box at the top, you can flip it and you can put um, a drink can in there, just like a sample. All this, my guy Tom, I've been working with him like 10 plus years. He does all of our packaging, but everything from packaging, books, like he's, yeah, amazing. So this was our postcard. We write notes on, we handwrite notes on every order. Uh, and these are, I think, the finished packaging. So how they look together. Um, yeah. And the drink. 
Yeah, so we're developing the drink at the same time. Yeah. Um, again, everything's kind of happening at the same time within a two year span. Um, so while we're finalizing all the formulas for the cosmetics, which took rounds and rounds and rounds of iterations and testing on friends and perfecting color and texture and everything, uh, we were also working on our beverage. Um, and so we were very lucky to, again, find a lab to work with us here in L.A. Um, to help us formulate the drink and our drink is actually based on a very popular drink. Uh, oh, he's got it right here um, from Japan. Uh, it's kind of like a Gatorade, um, but we wanted to make one that was healthier, that had less sugar, that had better quality ingredients, had more vitamins and also CBD in it um, because CBD has a great benefit for many reasons. Um, and so we worked with this lab to come up with many iterations of the formula, some of them a bit more salty, some a bit more sweet. Um, some of them had more acid or citrus, more yeah. citrus. Uh, and then we invited friends over to test all the drinks and give us their feedback on which variations they liked the most. Uh, and, you know, at the same time, Shun was working on the labeling, um, which also opened up a whole nother world to us. So beverage is just, you know, I think, I don't think, I mean, I think if we had known how crazy it is to be in the beverage industry, we probably would not have made a drink. Uh, but we were just like, oh, it's a full product line from a drugstore. We have to have a Gatorade alternative. Um, but there's a lot of headaches. You have to think about like FDA kind of rules around marketing and messaging. Um, the copy that goes on the label is like, like super vague. Yeah. So people might think like, what are these guys talking you about? You can't make any claims, especially when you have CBD in your product. <coughs> um, so learning about all those rules and, and just like, you know, diving into a whole new industry was um, a bit of a headache, but, you know, a great learning curve um, for us. Uh, these were our first, you know, label samples that we got, just trying them on for fit. Um, and eventually we got our drink. The drink was actually the first finished product that we got. Um, and we got it about six months before we actually launched the brand. Um, so we were very excited, um, to see the finished product, uh, and get it in hand, um, and test it out. Uh, we actually had already created the CGI images, um, for our website before we got the drink. So it was really awesome to see them side by side and actually, you know, they looked really similar. It looked really great. Um, and so because we had this kind of gap between our launch um, for the entire brand, we decided, well, let's just try apply for some retail stores. Um, so we applied for Air One, and a few weeks later, we actually heard back from Air One, um, which was crazy. And they were like, yes, we want you. Can you be in here in two weeks? And we were like, sure. And then they're like, need all this documentation that we didn't have. And so again, it's an industry thing and learning like what kind of documentation you need. Uh, you need like a distributor. So we scrambled to get a distributor to get us into Air One, um, moving inventory around. We're paying a fortune just to, to move inventory to one place to get it to Air, to Air One. Um, so just learning about the logistics um, of this industry was really crazy, but we did everything we can. It was a huge headache and scramble, but we got it in there. And it was just an amazing feeling be able to walk into a store and see this thing that you've been working on for two years, just sitting on the shelf for anyone to purchase. Um, so that was a great feeling. And of course I purchased one. I purchased many from, from Air One. <laughs> but um, just a really good feeling. And, uh, you know, at the same time, Shim was finalizing kind of the packaging for the, the six packs and the 12 packs that we would ultimately use to ship online. Um, so if you get a package from us, you actually will see this tape on our boxes and it has a binary code on it, which I'll let you guys figure out. Um, so yeah, this is us getting the first six pack box and packing it up. And it's just really exciting again to see the final product um, and have it in hand. And so, yeah, now we're at this point where we have we have the finished, you know, cosmetics, we have the finished drink and we have a complete product line. Uh, so this is the whole line that we launched with exactly a year ago today. So actually today is the anniversary of OEM. So happy birthday to us. Yeah, I for, almost forgot to mention it. Um, and so we had a cream, 
a soothing cream, um, which was for congestion and uh, coughs and also for muscle aches and pains. We had an ointment, which was for uh, skin ailments, uh, dry skin, uh, psoriasis and eczema. We had a nourishing lip balm. Uh, we had our rehydrating drink uh, with electrolytes. Uh, and then we also had our hand sanitizer, um, our Hinoki hand sanitizer. And this was the whole product line that we launched with. Um, and so the main theme around this line was to try and target more cold, because that was probably the most common thing that maybe someone might go into CVS for. Um, so generally these things are great for when you have a cold, you can rehydrate yourself, you can um, you know, nourish that dry skin, you can soothe those aches. Um, yeah, I think it was really important for us to come up with a full, not <clears throat> a full, but somewhat of, yeah a line because mm -hmm. if you think about it like if we just release the drink and then we come up with like a lip balm people will be like what is this you know it's just too confusing it's already like maybe confusing as is this is no not really a brand that has the selection of products but so it was uh quite important for us to push this together yeah it was kind of a crazy thing to do to try and produce this many different products in like, you know, industries that we hadn't had experience in. Um, but we, we were very adamant from the beginning that we needed to create a line. Uh, most of the products also have CBD in it. So, um, cause we just, you know, CBD is an amazing ingredient um, for your, you know, on your skin or for your nervous system, there's many different benefits. Um, but we had also no idea how difficult it is to sell CBD products. Um, there's all the barriers that come with that, especially online. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So we had to, you know, do a lot of learning and tackle a lot of those challenges as well. Um, let's see. So now that we have our full product line, um, you know, we are really ready to dive into the marketing side of things. So how are we going to sell this product? Um, so we already talked about starting with why, and that was the real foundation of our marketing. Um, this is another great quote from another author, um, Kyle Kelly, and it says, to be successful, to be a successful creator, you don't need millions. You don't need millions of dollars or millions of customers, millions of clients or millions of fans. To make a living as a craftsperson, photographer, musician, designer, author, animator, app maker, entrepreneur, or inventor, you need only a thousand true fans. So this really stuck with us. And we've heard it said in different ways from other, you know, writers is that, you know, if you really win over um, a few loyal customers, maybe it's a hundred, maybe it's a thousand, um, you'll create a foundation for a really great business. Uh, and that means putting in the time uh, and creating loyalty from the very beginning. So with our marketing, we really wanted to be transparent, show people the process and, and walk them through it with us so that they felt like they were a part of this brand, you know, moving into the future and with everything else that we do. So when we started to think about marketing, we tried to really think, how can we do things differently? How can we use the marketing channels that we have in a way that's kind of um, opposite of how you would think to use them? So for Instagram, for example, um, we decided we just wanted to have a static feed. So um, Shun worked with our good friend, Mark Bulford, um, on this vending machine concept uh, that we would launch with. And so they worked through kind of the designs of this, you know, vending machine. And ultimately this became our static um, feed when we launched with our products. So this is what it looked like at the end. Uh, so we launched with this, uh, we were like the anti feed per people. And we decided we'd only use Instagram stories to communicate. Uh, and so we used Instagram stories all the way leading up until up to launch uh, to show people the process of how we were making the brand. Uh, and then finally, when we launched, we, we had this, you know, static feed. Uh, of course, now we've broken this feed because we launched an incense and it didn't fit in the vending machine. Uh, so we now have, uh, we are posting on the feed, um, but we always want to think about it differently. So for a lot of like CPG brands or, um, you know, direct to consumer brands, they're usually very product oriented. So you go to their feed and they're very beautiful, crisp product shots. Uh, but again, that's very what focused. 
Uh, we wanted our Instagram feed to be very why focused. Um, so when you go on our feed, you'll see lots of like animals or supernatural things, um, things that inspire care, um, you know, and there are occasional products, but it's really showing the process, the behind the scenes, or even conceptual products um, that we have. Um, so yeah. And we just recently launched this campaign, uh, Landscape of Cares. And this is um, an opportunity to put some more humans into our feed because we really believe that, you know, care is a human interaction. And we wanna inspire care between humans. So we're now doing these interviews of people who are friends or friends of friends uh, and having them share their stories of care. So definitely check it out when you can. Um, Again, thinking against the grain and trying to think about how we can use marketing channels in like contradicting ways. Um, even our emails, we design them like they're text messages. So this is, for example, the first email we sent out, we wanted it to look like a text message to a friend. Um, and so most of our emails are all formatted this way. Um, when we actually launched, uh, we just invited uh, a small group of our friends to our house. We didn't want to have a huge thing, but again, it was, we were really thinking about, you know, those top, those hundred people that we wanted to create. Uh, we wanted to be our loyal kind of followers uh, and customers. We want to show them that we care about them. So we really had an intimate kind of launch party where we introduced people to our product. We told them about it um, and really kind of try to plant a seed that way. Um, our first actual like marketing push was with the drinks because we got them before we got the other products. Um, we actually put on our Instagram, you know, if anyone wants a six pack, we'll deliver it to them, hand deliver it to them in LA. And we actually got a huge response and ended up driving around LA um, for a few days, just dropping off six packs. But it was really great because, um, oh, and this is us packing the six packs uh, with our cat Zuma. Um, here we are packing the car, delivering six packs. Uh, everyone got a personal note. Um, so yeah, it was really great because, you know, it, it kind of created that initial buzz. People were sharing it again. They were close friends and we were showing our appreciation because they had been following us through the process for so long. Um, demos became huge. So again, this is still pre kind of launch. And even up until today, we were constantly going into Air One and doing demos in person. It's an amazing opportunity to get in front of, you know, customers, get their feedback uh, and uh, learn just kind of what they want, what they're looking for. We also have a lot of friends in the tennis industry. Um, so we go to tennis events and hand out uh, our drinks at tennis events. Uh, again, like building kind of a customer base there and loyalty there. Um, yeah, and we really love our friends and you know network who were sharing the products. So when we launched, that was huge for us. We just sent out tons of product to all our friends, uh, anyone who wanted to try it, um, because we really believe in the product. So we believe that if someone tries it, they're gonna wanna get it again. Uh, so we were just shipping it out to everyone. They were all sharing it. We were getting amazing initial kind of feedback uh, about people using it for their eczema, uh, people thinking it was cooler than stem player, um, people loving the smell, you know, just seeing this really great response on social media um, from the people that we appreciate and we love. And so like that kind of momentum really was great at the beginning. Um, and then more recently we've, you know, finally implemented, uh, reviews on our website. So now we have customers coming and actually leaving reviews on our website, um, giving us very validating kind of, uh, responses to our product that makes us really believe that this is a good product. Um, and, you know, we're focused on winning them over these individual people over. So we feel like we're achieving that goal that we, we came out for. And here we are today, um, you know, we're a two person team, but we recently added on a third. So uh, thank you, Nellie, our marketing assistant who's joined us. Um, and now we're kind of this three person team trying to plan for the future and we have lots of exciting things coming up. Yeah, we're <laughs> constantly developing new products. Uh, this is um, a fragrance file. I think we're gonna, start putting them into our packages. Um, yeah, I think we posted this yesterday. Um, we're start making 
different, like, I guess more conceptual. I just, I guess, like, wanted to push more of, like, ideas out there. This was done with um, an industrial designer, Batol Benitez. He's from Chicago. Uh, yeah, he, we've been working together uh, on some peripheral, like, products. Uh, we definitely want to get into hardware. It's not just uh, something that, yeah, yeah. And um, this is going to be our first collaboration with uh, our friends at Charlotte Pyman and Herrero. It, they're um, an architecture firm and also interior decorating firm. Um, we actually went to, <coughs> sorry, we actually went to high school with Andre, which is one of the partners. And we ended up in LA and now they're killing it. Uh, and so we're super happy to be able to collaborate with them on an incense holder, which should come out September, September probably. with a, a key retailer that we really love and look up to. So that's super exciting for us. And um, like, I, I guess long term, we're always, I mean, this is always the ultimate goal is, you know, this there's this thing called super centos in japan uh, it's a place where you know you pay a fixed fee and you get a yukata which is like a robe you there's hot springs like a bunch of different ones pool uh restaurant massage uh and it's just a place where you get to unwind and relax um but what is like i guess our version of that Yeah, what does that look like? What, uh, um, sorry. <laughs> what does that experience look like or feel like? And yeah, I guess for short term, we're looking at more of just, uh, I guess, a stepping stone to that. And what does like a new drugstore uh, look like or feel like? And um, hopefully we'll be launching that sometime <laughs> in the future. Um, and I think that's kind of where maybe be the best place for people to experience what OEM is about. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, that wraps it, wraps it up. Very cool. Um, yeah, it's really interesting to see, you know, going from calibrating you know, the folds of the cardboard box to thinking about what that space, you know, to experience everything kind of looks like and like how that journey, you know, shares and like moves in, in tandem. Like, you know, how there are like, like looking at this image, right? And then thinking about the box. In some ways they're one and the same, right? It's like about how brand can extend beyond like any one thing and start to encompass and like bleed into like different experiences and the process. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really cool um, to see. I don't, I don't know if we have questions that popped up into the chat, um, but I can kind of kick it off. There is one thing that I think it'd be cool to like hear maybe <coughs> both, both of you elaborate on, which is like, you know, in these, in these sorts of spaces, like how do we see, or like, how do you think about community and like centering, you know, almost, like these things around community, you know, like, I guess, where do you see that value like going in the future? Like this idea of community? Yeah, I mean, for us, I think we wanna feel like people are growing with us and feel like they're a part of this journey. And so that's why we've always been very transparent with our process. Um, because we don't want to feel like it's a dictatorship where we're kind of like telling people what to buy, we're spitting it out and they need to make the decision to buy it or not. We want them to feel like they're part of what we're doing and the reason why we're doing it. Um, so part of that might be like, you know, some sort of like membership program, or it might be some sort of like feedback program that we're talking about launching soon, uh, where we get feedback from those people who are like, you know, the loyal people who've been from the, there from the beginning uh, and creating community just in terms of our process of production and, and building the, the company, but also thinking about how care can expand outside of our walls. 
so right now for us, that's donating a percentage of our sales every month um, to different causes. Uh, right now we're donating 1% um, to various causes every month. Uh, but for us, it needs to go beyond that, not just like giving out money, but also just um, thinking about, you know, how can we um, help like the elderly population, which is a very important cause to us. Um, and it's also a hugely growing demographic in the U.S. And it's going to be a major problem that no one's really talking about in the U.S. Uh, so it's thinking about, you know, how can we create programs one day where, you know, OEM is helping elderly, uh, or going out into communities and helping, helping people, um, you know, it's all going to come with scale. Uh, and right now it's that 1% of our sales, but tomorrow or in the future, it might be, you know, a program where we have staff going to like an elderly home, or maybe we have an elderly home or a center or, you know, somewhere where people can go. And I think this is where the super cento idea comes in too. uh, building a physical space where people can gather, where they can come, they can, um, kind of check in on their, themselves um, and work on their mental health and their physical health. Um, so there's many aspects of community that is going to be threaded through it. Very cool. Um, well, again, thank you so much for like sharing this entire sort of process, your journey, your thoughts around like these values, like community and care and um, it's been, yeah, it's, it's really cool to see how it's evolved and like some of the ideas and some of the thinking of like where it's going. And I know I'll, I'll personally be sort of looking out and, um, and watching and excited to see where this goes. Um, so yeah, thank you for sharing your evening with us. Um, thank you. Thank you. thanks Appreciate guys. It. And thanks to all our friends who came out. We see you. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, have a wonderful evening, and uh, I'm sure we'll be in touch. Thanks. Bye. Thanks a ton. Bye.